So this talk is what has long strange trip it's been. Of course, it's make could stand for IT and probably will be with little forward looking, hopefully. For those of you who do not know me for some reason, I've been in the computer industry for over 50 years. I started in 1969. I've had a wide variety of different jobs. I've traveled to more than 100 countries and most of them more than one time talking with all sorts of people about computers in general and open and free software. One of the things I'm happiest about is I tend to be pragmatic. So while I don't spit on people for not using free software or open source, I do believe it is the best way of doing code. And so consequently, I'm not religious about it, but I still say prayers for the unwashed. So I'm going to be going very fast on these slides because I have a lot of them and not much time. I'm going to go back to the very beginning when I started off. It wasn't computer science. It was kind of computer black magic. We didn't have any networking unless you were carrying a box of cards down the hall. We had no security other than locking the computer room door before you went home. We had no graphics really except ASCII art printed out on a line printer. And there were no real systems administrators. We had operators to start the programs and things. And no, Tux didn't exist back then, even though I did find this nice ASCII art image of him. We had large companies that sold systems and they sold hardware, software, and support. Channel partners were developed to be able to support these things. And then you had original equipment manufacturers and distributors and retailers making money off of the software. The year I started was 1969. Uh, there was Woodstock and no, I didn't go there because I was in university trying to be an electrical engineer. There was Stonewall Inn with the LBGTQ riots and started gay pride. And I didn't go to that either, even though it was close to me in New York. Uh, we put hum humans on the moon and no, I didn't go there either. And Mr. Bezos wasn't around to give me a free ride. But the ARPANET was starting up and Unix was starting up. It was also the last time I shaved and I wrote my first program. And that's actually the computer system there that I used to write my first program. It's an IBM 1130. It ran one job at a time. It had no operating system. You basically linked your device drivers into your program. I programmed it in on Fortran using punch cards. I was going to Drexel University. And by this time, I had had three years of analog electronics behind me in high school. And while I was a co-op at the West Electric Company in Baltimore, they offered me a correspondence course called Programming the IBM 1130 Computer in Fortran. And I took the correspondence course, read a book, practiced at the computer which they had there, and that's how I got started. But the real thing that convinced me not to be an electrical engineer anymore was that on the uh, manufacturing floor of Western Electric, they had huge machines that made wire and cable. And one time I was almost electrocuted by 800 volts and 600 amps. I could no longer see anything from my elbow down to my fingers. All I saw was sparks and flame coming out of the smoke. And I said, no, I think I'm going to program computers, you know, in an air conditioned room with punch cards. And the worst thing that would happen is I get a paper cut. Back in those days, there were very few professional programmers. You wrote programs to solve your own problems, to scratch your own itch, as it were. Maybe you were a mathematician or a physicist or an engineer or a business person or an educator. And you wrote the programs and then you said, well, you know, what am I going to do with these, right? And, you know, you were solving them just to solve your own programs, just because you needed the computer to do it. In fact, I had a professor who was teaching data processing, Dr. James McKinnis, and he said to me, John, you will never earn a living as a professional programmer. And I'm still waiting to see if it was true. 
There were also lots of user groups, and these were typically funded by companies, Share from IBM, Dekas from DEC, Brainshare from Novell. And they had libraries of software that their users would donate to the libraries, and then the libraries would send them and send out a catalog of the programs by paper, by mail, because there was no real networking back in those days. And then you could order the programs for your particular machine or your particular operating system, if you had one. And you might pay $5 to get a text editor on a long folded piece of paper, paper tape. As a university student, $5 was a lot of money because you could use that to buy five pitchers of beer. And I often had to make the choice between a text editor or five pitchers of beer. But back in those days, the programs are not only not copyrighted, but they were encouraged to be copied. And so I would go to the school store and I would get some new paper tape and put it through an ASR 33 teletype and make copies of it so that I could sell those copies to my roommates for a dollar a copy. And after I'd made 10, made 10 copies, I had enough money for my pitcher of beer to buy the original text editor and to give the copies away to my fellow students. And so people would say to me, why do these people give away their software? And I say, well, you were writing it to solve their own problem. And you know, after they have it, though, selling software is hard. It is hard. You have to create good documentation about your product. You have to give some people support every once in a while. They expect that. You have to advertise your software in order to be able to sell it. And these people were just not in the business of selling software. They were in the business of doing whatever their business was. And so they also found that by giving away their software, other people would help them make it better. And they might triple or double their programming staff, which is now them and one other person or maybe two other people working on it. And they would exchange coding styles and things like that. And maybe every once in a while, they would get invited to a DECA symposium or a SHARE symposium. And they'd give a talk about what they were doing and find more people to help them. And maybe those people would offer them beer or dinner or even a job. And these are all some of the reasons why we write free software today. Also in 1969, a very special year, a guy in Helsinki, Finland, named Linus Torvalds was born. So the rest of the talk is going to be about lessons that I've learned along the way, various lessons I've learned at DEC and in the free software world. Use the term impossible sparingly. You can say difficult. You can say it may take a while. You can say it's unlikely. You can say I have other priorities. All those are fine. But when you use the word impossible, you're putting a really heavy load on things. And I, you know, I had a person tell me that writing a kernel in a distributed manner, the way it was done, was impossible. And this person was an architect of digital Unix. And I reminded him that, gee, it's already been done, it's already working. And yet he was still unconvinced. Another time uh, I was asked to allow the Unix system that DEC had to probe the devices on the VAX Unibus and QBus and other types of buses. And I was told by the engineer in charge of the project that it was impossible because Unix just could not do that. I was a little bit you know, interested because VMS could do it, VAX Alon could do it, all these other operating systems could do it. I could not understand why it was impossible that Unix couldn't do it. So I went back to my cubicle and I found a little diagnostic program that not only scanned the bus, but printed out the devices and everything about them to a file. And I took that file and put it through awk, then created a configuration script, a configuration file for Berkeley Unix at the time. 
and took all of that over to the engineer. This took me about a quarter of a day. Took that over to the engineer and said, oh, look, I just did the impossible in a quarter of a day. He was embarrassed and took it a little bit further. And the next time we came out with the kernel, it didn't have to have any intervention for probing the bus and finding the devices. Be ready to make a person cry. This sounds like a horrible thing. But one day I was stopped by a peer's office in digital. I looked in and I said, you know, I looked at that program you wrote and that was a really good program. You did a really good job of analyzing the problem and creating the code and working it into the system. And that engineer who was a male in his mid forties broke down into tears, was sobbing in his office. I said, what's wrong? He says, you were the first person who ever told me that. He said, my boss is giving me raises and you know, even promotions and things like that, but he never pointed to a particular project that I worked on and told me I had done a really good job. And that made a big impression on me. They just go along and just say to people, yes, that's a really good job you did. I think we all should remind, be reminded of that. Watch what you say and to who. Ken Olson was famous in a lot of circles for his dislike of Unix, if you want to call it that. But I knew Ken a different way. And I first met him first person to person in 1986, where he came to give a talk in the love in the VMS land of New Hampshire. And he gave a talk and in the middle of it, he said something about loving Unix and everybody who is mostly from VMS laughed hysterically. But afterwards, I walked up to him. I said, Mr. Olson, you said you love Unix. And I just wondered, I'm from the Unix group. I just wondered how much you loved Unix. He goes, well, last year we were a three, $13 billion company. And out of that, $600 million came out of Unix. So I guess I love Unix $600 million worth. I said, thank you very much, Mr. Olson. That tells me exactly how much you love Unix, and that's good enough for me. Another time, the press came back and said, Ken Olson said that Unix is snake oil. But that's not what he said. He said that Unix vendors were selling Unix like they were snake oil salesmen. That Unix was good for everything in every case. And there were other operating systems that had much better real time, that had much better availability, that had much better multi-threaded. It's not that he was saying that Unix was bad. He was just saying that everything for everybody. Another time, the KO said that standards were as interesting as a Russian truck, and the press really loved that. What he, led, what he later said was that he is an engineer, and he doesn't like the nitpicky, very painful process of creating a written standard. But he does, when the standard is implemented, when the standard is finished, he does like implementing that standard to make it stable, fast, and maintainable. KO also said one time that he had two children. One wore a vest and a suit, and he put him in charge of the bank and stuff, but the other was a break dancer and was flexible and fast, and he loved them both. And of course, he meant his two children were VMS and Unix. So you have to get people to say, what are you really talking about? What have you really thought these things through? And KO really did love Unix. One of the things I like about free software and open source is that a lot of the people that are working on it aren't afraid to throw away what they've done before. 
if you're in a commercial environment and you're an engineering manager or even an engineer, you go up to your manager and say, hey, this piece of code I wrote five years, 10 years ago is really showing its age. It really needs to be rewritten. And the manager will say, well, you know, I'm sorry, we don't have the resources for that. We have all these other requirements to do that. But the thing I like about free software is the free software community does that type of thing. And a very good example of that was a number of years ago when the entire IO subsystem was pulled apart and put back together in a much nicer way that allowed to be much more maintainable and flexible. How you look at things really makes a difference. So from time to time at DEC, we would have engineers who would write a piece of code for maybe a perceived product. And for one reason or another, DEC decided that they were not going to sell that code or not going to sell that product. The engineers would say, well, can I turn this into free software? Can I make this open? And they would have to go before committees and they would have to explain why and they'd have to justify it. And it was like running a gauntlet with whipping, people whipping you. And a lot of these engineers, after they came out, even if they were successful said, never again, I'm never gonna go through that again. But there was another computer company in the same time frame that said, we need to think of what we're doing as open source unless there's a business case for keeping it closed. And this put the illness back on the product managers, on the people that wanted to make the money for making the justification of turning this into a product. And it made all the difference in their engineers being able to do that. Now, things are not always planned. Everybody thinks that, you know, planning goes into a lot of stuff, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. When the original ISO 9660, which was the standard for putting software onto CD-ROMs was being written, it didn't support Unix very well. It only had eight character file names uh, actually, no, I'd say 11 character file names, eight before the dot and three after, kind of like VMS and MS-DOS had at the time. It only had four levels of directories. It didn't support symbolic links. And so a man named Andrew Young of Young Minds created something called the Rockridge extensions that allowed POSIX file system semantics to be added to ISO 9660 without breaking anything that was in the actual standard itself. But the editor who was working on those standards at the time, who was a DEC employee, said, no, I'm not going to allow those standards, those into the, into the formal standard, those extensions of the formal standard. And he was blocking Andrew from putting them in. So Andrew called me at DEC and explained the situation. And I went over to the person's desk and I basically blackmailed him into putting those extensions into the original standard before it went out the door. I reminded him that my vice president of the Unix space was the same vice president that he had in the VMS space. And my vice president wouldn't like it very much if we couldn't put Unix on the CD-ROMs easily. You also have to find the proper job for the tool. A lot of people, no, no, Mad Dog, you got that confused. You're supposed to find the proper tool for the job. Well, maybe. But I had a young programmer I knew who was working out on the West Coast, and he was looking forward to attending Naval Academy. He was very proud of it. He was a very patriotic young man, he wanted to do something for his country. I told him that he would probably contribute more to the country and to the world by being a good FOSS programmer. And so I talked him out of going to the Naval Academy. I talked him into staying with a company that was writing a lot of free software and doing a lot of good things. And then he conceived of and wrote the first SourceForge software. 
So SourceForge, a, res a repository that helped a lot of people create new projects, came from the fact that I convinced somebody not to go into the Naval Academy. Do favors for other people. Um, a lot of people think that companies work off of programs and plans and you send them to your management and things, but sometimes they work off of favors being pulled in. So the SIG chairman for the Unix Special Interest Group named Kurt Riesler needed money to bring a speaker to Dicas in 1994. He kept asking people for different monies, you know, because Kurt didn't have any money. And he kept copying me on the emails. Finally, I went to my management and my management had not heard about this person or anything he had done. And I hadn't at the time. But I arranged for this person to come to deck as a favor to Kurt because I liked and trusted Kurt. And that person was Linus Torvalds, the Dekas in May of 1994, when I met Linus and we conceived of porting Linux to the 64-bit alpha chip. And favors work in both directions. That was my favor to Kurt. But when he came back from that trip, I needed a favor. I needed somebody who had an alpha workstation. And back in those days, we're talking maybe 35,000 US dollars for Linus to start the port. And I had no time to write that justification paper to explain to people why I was doing this. So I called up a friend of mine named Jim Jackson, who was in the workstation marketing group and said, Jim, I don't have time to tell you who this is or what he did, but it's very important that he get an alpha workstation as soon as possible. And the next day, a $30,000 workstation was headed to Helsinki, Finland. Be true in what you want. Now, we all have heard of Caldera, company that was a Linux company, but they weren't really concerned with being open. They weren't concerned about the concept of free software. What they really wanted was a royalty-free Unix. They didn't care if it went out in binary form, if people had the, soft, the source code or not. They kept buying or trying to buy binary packages like Visix for the desktop so they could put it into their distribution they just didn't want to have to manage the licenses that was required for Unix systems at the time. Eventually, Caldera bought most of the organization that I'm going to call GoodSco, the original Santa Cruz operations. I wonder, uh-oh. Another thing, we'll get to more about GoodSco in a few minutes. Another thing you need to do is build an elevator pitch to life. You have to say to yourself, what do you really want out of life? And be able to explain that to somebody in about 30 seconds. That's going to help you focus on what's really important. So now we're going to talk about Good Skull, Santa Cruz Operations. It was founded by Larry Michaels, who was the father, and Doug Michaels, who was the son. Doug had gone to the University of California, Santa Cruz, and they decided that they were going to make a company to first do support for Unix and then actually produce Linux, the Unix distributions. And SCO actually sold more Unix licenses than any other vendor, including Sun. Eventually, they saw the writing on the wall because they were being pushed in from one side by Windows NT and from the other side by Linux. And so they formed a third company called Tarantella and they started to sell other types of services from that and they sold their Unix business or the rest of their Unix business to Caldera. And so Caldera saw that this is the way they were going to get around the licensing of Unix because they said, well, we own the copyright, we own the intellectual property of Unix. 
So about the same time, there was an organization called Uniform that was the commercial side of Unix systems. It had been started a number of years before. I was on the board of directors. And Uniform decided that they were going to present a Lifetime Achievement Award to Linus Torvalds in 1997 at the tender age of 27 years old. I mean, by that time, I was 47. I was wondering where my Lifetime Achievement Award was. But one particular Uniform board member was very insistent, more insistent than the rest of us, that Linus get this. And then that board member insisted on presenting the award to Linus at the conference and taking out taking Linus out to breakfast the day before. That person was Doug Michaels of Santa Cruz Operations. And later on, he wrote a email that said that SCO had gotten a lot out of Linux and had given a lot to Linux. And I found it very interesting during the Linux, uh, the, the SCO IBM slash Linux battles that, you know, why would SCO want to sue somebody that Larry Michaels had actually given a lifetime presentation award to? I had taken this picture of Doug with Linus, put it onto a t-shirt and sent this whole thing to the IBM lawyers who were helping to fight the battle. So it was never the, the good SCO, Doug and Larry, that was associated with that. It was only the people from Caldera. So a side note about slides while I'm talking to you is that for years, when Linus was giving presentations about Linux, he only showed one slide in his entire talk. And that was a slide that showed the projective growth of Linux on as against time. And the slide was always a straight line. We showed, gee, that's really good growth. Until one day in the middle of his talk, Linus noted that this straight line was, pro was plotted on logarithmic paper and therefore actually represented a uh, exponential growth. Another interesting thing about the past was O'Reilly. All of us are familiar with O'Reilly and the Unix books they put out, the different books about things like Grep and Awk and Sed and all the different animal books. But then at one time, O'Reilly actually stopped publishing Unix books and started publishing Windows NT books. And they had come out with several Windows NT books to try and you know, show people the wonders of Windows NT. But when Linux started to gain popularity, Tim dusted off his Unix books again and started to sell Linux books with the same, basically the same text in them. Now, along these lines, over the years, I've become to realize that people do not buy hardware or software. You know, you, you don't go into a person's house and see a piece of hardware up on the wall with a candle on either side, like a shrine, or you don't see a box of software set up as a shrine with the candles, unless you're in Larry Ellison's house and it's Oracle. But what they're doing is they're buying solutions to problems. What's the best way to solve that problem? And if even if you're trying to play a game, if you could play the game with two tin cans and a string in the middle, you would. Maybe it's a multi-user networked game, but that's what you're trying to do is solve that problem. So the game has changed since I started into computing. No longer do computers cost millions of dollars and take up a room and need water cooling and air conditioning. You could buy a single board computer, a Raspberry Pi. You could even do your development on the web without any hardware. And of course, the software can be collaborative in ways that we didn't even dream of in 1969. The marketing can be done a lot through social marketing. 
You don't need to hire a large marketing firm to do your marketing for you. And the financing can be crowdsourced. You no longer have to find a, you know, a uh, venture, a vulture capitalist to give you your first round of financing to lose control of your money. But in all of this, having a prototype is key. Being able to show people that your idea could actually work. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, a prototype is when it's worth 10 million pictures. I've recently become interested in either a single owner company or cooperatives. Capitalism is one type of economic uh, capability, one type of way of doing it, and there's nothing inherently wrong with capitalism. But a single owner business or an employee or customer owned cooperative have a lot of things that are going for it. So for the people out there that are thinking about starting up a company, think about starting up either an employee or customer owned cooperative. So what about the future? I'm really not a good predictor of the future. When I was back at Bell Labs in the period of 1977, oh, no, sorry, 1980 to 83, a bunch of our Unix people were sitting around and we said, what's the next operating system going to be? And they talked about it for a while. And I said, I don't know what the next operating system will be, but it better be called Unix because I could see how Unix was changing and getting better and better with every release. And I saw the incremental change that was going on. And I'm fairly happy to say that maybe I wasn't completely right to be called Unix, but at least there's a couple of the letters still left around. I am a little scared, quite frankly, of what most people call AI, artificial intelligence, but I call II, inorganic intelligence. What most people describe as artificial intelligence is not what I think is artificial intelligence. I look at the human mind as a bunch of neurons and synapses tied together with electrical signals and chemical reactions. And I don't see any reason at all why an inorganic intelligence can't be created that is ever as capable as a human being in thinking. We just don't know how to do it yet. And we don't have systems that are fast enough to do it, but we will. And the other thing that scares me a little bit is quantum computing. I'm kind of glad at this point that I'm 71 and that I've been able to go through the last 50 years of computing to see the tremendous improvements in it. I'm a little bit uh, put off by some of the things that have happened, like some of the aspects of social networking. But I think that we still have a lot of good stuff that can be done if we just keep focused on the good parts. And so when we think about the past forwards, I like to think that closed source is the enemy. It's not really Microsoft. It's not really Apple. It's not really uh, you know, it's certainly not BSD. I've had people accuse me, you don't like BSD. Yes, I love BSD. But closed source is the enemy. And what I also don't like about the concept of open source is that open source is good for developers. But the end user, if they can't get the source code to be able to change their end user product, to be able to fix the end user system they got, are still stuck. And maybe people say, well, they don't have the capability, they don't have the technical knowledge to do it. Well, that might be true, but if they had access to the source code, they'd be able to hire somebody who had the technical knowledge. And sooner or later, they may decide that trying to fix that piece of code rather than going to another piece of code or making an upgrade is not worth it. But that is back in their business. It's their decision. 
And so free software puts the control back in the hands of the end user, whoever they are. That's what's most important. Tell other people you did good when they deserve to be told. Keep scratching your itch. You guys have been doing a great job. Just keep scratching that. Be able to guide the meeting from the back of the room. In the times that I've attended the plumber conference in person, I was always kind of interested that Linus would sit in the back of the room at his table with his little microphone. And every once in a while, he has something to say, turn it on, say it, and turn it off again. I think that's a great way of having leadership. Remember that building the team is at least as important as building the code. We're all getting older. I remember Linus as a 21 year old college student. I've seen young people as old as 12 and a half create Linux distributions. I've seen a lot of people, but they're all getting older. And so we have to go out and we have to make sure that the young people are learning this stuff coming in. I remember that at the first used Linux conference in San Diego, we had a wonderful presentation on Malik and the type of work that had been done in Malik in Linux to make it efficient and everything else. At the end of the presentation, a friend of mine stood up and said, wonderful presentation, but we actually had that presentation 20 years ago. And we found that we came to exactly the same conclusions, only we had actual measurements to show it. So we need to not reinvent the wheel, but we need to be able to pass that on to the younger people coming in. So my last thought on this is to become a mentor to a newbie. Actually pick somebody out and say, I want to you know, pass on what I know to you so that they can become the apprentice to a master plumber. With that, thank you very much. I'll try and answer any questions or things in the comments. And Kate, you can take back the uh, the thing sure. if you want. Sounds good. Yeah, please uh, feel free to unmute and ask questions or turn on your camera and then unmute. Those questions or put them in the chat. Thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing that um, we're going to be doing as part of Plumbers this year is we've been looking back, we've gotten some great advice in terms of going forward and want to have a little bit of a, um, where do you think we will actually be going? So uh, there's a very short survey, about a minute uh, to type of what you think, very simple. And feel free to you know write in in the free you know fill in blank sort of section of it. Um, but you know where are we heading as the Linux community? Um, the link is also in the shared notes as well as in the chat if people have access to it. And hopefully, while that um, some people have had a chance to come up with some questions for John. No, everyone's clicking on the survey. Okay. <laughs> Um, which other, um, who else was your mentor along the way, John? Uh, Doug? Well, actually, I had a picture of them with, along with the IBM 1130. One okay. was named Dick Newmeyer, the other was named Dick Poole. And the third one was a, a lady named Bev, who unfortunately, after 50 years, I've forgotten what her, her last name is. But uh, Dick and Dick were both programmers back in those days, and Bev was the computer operator. Um, back in those days, none of the engineers, we had about 400 engineers at Western Electric who were electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, 
all different types, and none of them knew how to program. My uh, immediate supervisor, a man by the name of John Kammer, who is what I would call an electrical engineer's electrical engineer, he knew everything. He was so amazed when I would do even the simplest things on the IBM 1130. He had just no idea of what the computer could do or how it worked. And, um, but they were all mentors to me as a young engineer. And uh, there's been just so many of them. And then, of course, I've been very lavish with my personal hero list, which includes Rear Admiral Grace Mary Hopper, who I had the pleasure of meeting one time, having dinner with her. Oh, wow. uh, Dr. Maurice Wilkes, who was the head of the EDSAC project, who um, also invented microcode and the concept of subroutines. Doug McElroy, who came up with the idea of pipes and filters, uh, is a friend of mine. He lives up in Hanover, New Hampshire. I knew De Ken and Dennis and uh, went out with them a lot. Not a lot, but a fair number of times. And, you know, and I still have, I still have people that I look at as my personal heroes as I go along. That's wonderful. We all need to have our personal hero list. Um, and thank you for being online. One of the other questions that's come in from is from um, Nick uh, Desalniers, who says, earlier you alluded to a competitor of DEC, perhaps, the defaulted, uh, the defaulted to open source unless it, there was a business need. I love the anecdote, but um, you never said who that was. Who is it? It was IBM. I was at, I was at a uh, conference, I think it was around 1995, in Austin, Texas. It must have been later than that. I can't remember exactly when, but it was the opening of their Linux uh, development center. And uh, Dan Fry, who was the head of their open source uh, group at the time, took me there. And Dan kept asking me the question, uh, is the Linux community going to, you know, react to how's the Linux community going to react to a large company like IBM coming in? Are we the are we the elephant that's going to stop them out? I says, Dan, as long as you you know adhere to the licenses, as long as you really, you know, see Linux and free software, then the Linux community will welcome you. You will have some people who will think it's some type of conspiracy. But the people that really matter, the people that are really thinkers, will understand that unless companies like yours can make money with free software, that it will go forward slowly like a glacier. You have to allow people to make money with it. And I don't know if people remember this, but there used to be only three laws of the GPL that it was you had to show your source code, you know, all is the, but the, the fourth law that said you had to be able to allow people to use the software for any purpose whatsoever. That actually was added afterwards. And so it was in that meeting there in Austin, I had given a talk to a lot of the IBM developers there. They asked me to step back into this room because they had a private meeting that they wanted to have. And I was in the room for a long time. And then finally, I had to go find a bathroom. And when I was looking for the bathroom, I looked up on the screen that way they were still doing presentations. And I saw a letter from Lou Gershner projected up on the screen. And that letter said, in the past, IBM has been a closed source company unless we've made the business case for making something open source. He says, now from the, in the future, we're going to be an open source company, unless there's a business case for making it closed. And I chills went up and down my back because I realized that that actually turns that gauntlet upside down. So, you know, I'm not saying that IBM is perfect in this. No company is really perfect, but that, letter meant a lot to me. Great. Um, so we've had some questions coming in. 
Um, okay. And just trying to keep. So um, Josh has uh, commented in on uh, Kim Thompson's uh, top thing that he would change with hindsight was to spell create with an E. Uh, with the benefit of your decades of hindsight, what fundamental aspect of Linux design would you wish to do differently or explore alternatives to that seem today like they're too hard to change? Or maybe I should be saying impossible. <laughs> um, well, I will tell you one thing. It isn't, it isn't directly an answer to your question there, but I've given a lot of thought to Plan 9 as a follow-on to Unix. And you had Ken, you had Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and a lot of the other Unix people kind of leave Unix development and go off and do Plan 9 because that was going to fix everything that was wrong with Unix. The problem was that they built in no Unix compatibility. And so you had, didn't have a way, at least at that time, you did not have a way of taking over the applications that had been written for Unix and put them onto Plan 9. You had to redesign the whole thing. And I told them, I says, you know, guys, developers are tired of that. You know, they don't want to have to do a major rewrite of billions and billions of lines of code. We just, in my mind, the reason that Unix, one of the reasons that Unix was so successful was it was the same operating system across all these different architectures, relatively so. And Linux just made that even stronger. It was interesting in the Unix space, we had these different Unix uh, distributions that all had different names, SunOS, Solaris, HPUX, AIX, Altrix, and that confused people because they would come and they say, I want Unix. And all the, all the salespeople of these different companies would say, well, I have AIX or I have Altrix. And the managers were too, I don't know, they didn't understand, they couldn't see that Windows NT was on the same interface, the same software on every platform. And Windows, was the same as it came from every vendor. That's what people really wanted. They wanted a secure, they wanted a, a stable, efficient operating system on all of their platforms. So they didn't have to retrain their people as it just went from vendor to vendor. Mm -hmm. And Linux was just, you know, perfect for that. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to change something, in that oh i see you're, you're taking <laughs> notes on this okay so I, I i i can't really think of anything that, not okay. to say that there won't be something in the future sure uh another question that's come in from daniel wagner is why do you think the uh, linux kernel contributors contribute um do you think that all genders have the same motivations um well you know it's interesting that Linus has admitted that licensing wasn't the topmost thing in his mind when he brought out the project. And he, you know, was not concerned about having a free operating system. He was more interested in having a good operating system. And somebody had convinced him to use the GPL. And later on, he said he thought that that made a lot of difference because it encouraged people to write for it. Um, to have a really good kernel for the basis of their operating system. And it's also very interesting writing kernel code because I compare application code as code that is written on a calm, placid pond or lake. And the kernel is like you're in the middle of a tidal wave it's hit by a hurricane and a tornado, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You're working with very knowledgeable, intelligent people. And I think that all of these are reasons why people write code. I love writing code because it's like a puzzle. And I love, and, and, and the other thing is, it gives you instant gratification. It's, it's you know, 
if if you make a mistake, it's if, if something goes wrong, it's typically from something that you made a mistake on. And when you find the answer to it, you correct it, then it feels very good. Now it's true that there could be problems with the compiler or there could be problems with the hardware and stuff like that. But you know, it's that solving that puzzle and getting it to work like you wanted it to work. That was very good for me. That kind of nicely leads into the next question he's got here, which is what are your thoughts on complexity? And things are getting more and more complex to program. Do you think we have the community to tackle the upcoming problems? I tell you something, I I don't know if I was just starting out in software these days that I would do that. I mean, like I said in one of my first slides, I didn't have to worry about security. I didn't have to worry about networking. I didn't have to, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't have to worry about. It was just punching the cards and putting them on the IBM 1130. Um, I don't know. It, it, I think it's tough to start out as Mm -hmm. a programmer these days for example if you're going to write a game you know my game was hunt the wumpus or adventure right <laughs> <laughs> and uh these days to write a, to write a good game well you have to have 3d graphics and you have to have music and you have to have you know and, you, and you're, you're you're dealing with stuff that is real time almost real time mm -hmm. it was it was funny because in the early days of linux kernel soft real time wasn't that great you know i think that what was happening was there was a lot of threads that got caught down in device drivers and device drivers weren't written properly so one day i called up linus one of the few times i ever called up linus to give him any type of advice on linux i called him up he was still working at transit meta and i said linus it'd be really great if you could improve the soft real time performance of the Linux kernel. He goes, what do you mean? It's great with soft real time. I says, Linus, how can you say that? He goes, well, if you're playing Quake, that shows you how long ago it was. If you're playing Quake and the monster has a gun in his hand, you hit the key, you kill the monster. That's real time. I said, Linus, put a real gun in that monster's hand and see if you can say the same thing. There was silence for a couple minutes on the phone. He goes, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and the next release of the Linux kernel, the soft real time had been improved dramatically. Excellent. So, um, yeah, things are complex. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of the tools are a lot better, too. And, you know, so I think it's and, and, and a lot of the knowledge that we're coding with. Mm -hmm. I, I say to myself, why did Linux happen? when it did and i think it comes down to two or three things the fact that there was significantly sophisticated hardware that was becoming cheaper so that people could have it if you if you if you think about it, linus started his his project when he had a brand new 386 that was the first intel processor that supported demand page virtual memory and when he started the project, the 386 was kind of new. But by the time it was getting along, the 486 had come out. And so people were taking their 386s and putting them to different things. So you might even be able to take one of those home and do some programming in your house. Internet to the house was coming in. I mean, internet had been to companies and universities and stuff like that. But at that time, it was coming into the house. So you can sit there at home and work on this stuff. And finally, there was enough information about how to write kernels that was freely available, some of it over the internet, so that you could read about it and people were becoming more knowledgeable about how kernels actually worked. People often criticize uh, the GNU project for the herd. And I think that Stallman did exactly the right thing. Because if he had started a GNU project by writing the herd, he would still be writing it 10 years later and he would have still have no applications to put on top of it. Instead, he started with things that every developer needed, text editors, libraries, compilers, 
utilities and things like that made them portable. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, the only thing that was really necessary was the kernel. And so it just all fell together. I think we have one one last question. I think we'll wrap it up, but this has been awesome. Um, any thoughts, advice? This is from Guru on how to navigate the conflict between company objectives, we all get paid mostly, versus the latest community direction on projects and ideas. Well, you know, I mean, you, you, you have to do what your company wants you to. And that's because they're going to pay you. And it's reasonable that, you know, but there's been a say well i get paid for my company by my company because my company is highly dependent on the work that we do with free software and so you can go back to your manager <coughs> and convince them perhaps that they should allow you to have a certain amount of your time your paid time even to work on things for the free software community and you know and then there are people I mean, there are a very good kernel developer <coughs> who's a medical doctor. At the end of the day, he goes home and he likes writing code because it relieves him of the stress of being a medical doctor. So you have to be able to balance that out. But I would also add you have an even tougher thing because you also have to balance your time with your children, with your spouse, with your you know, with a lot of other things. And that's just part of being an engineer, I guess, or a software developer or a person in the free software space. You have to have that balance of everything. And uh, that's the best thing I can I can help you with. <laughs>